Now we're live streaming this, so uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Russell Roberts. I'm actually a Professorship of Leadership and Management at Charles Sturt Uni. Um, just the first thing, we are live streaming this session, so if you didn't want to be videoed, I'd encourage you to sort of go in that back corner, but if you do want to be front and centre, come and sit, you know, front here in front of the camera. And uh, uh, John, stay where you are. Yeah, no, no, you're just you're rushing. I know. <clears throat> um, this is meant to be a really interactive uh, workshop. We've been changed, I'm not sure why. Um, so we're going to try and uh, reach out to people uh, who are streaming. Um, we'll see how that works. But really, this is meant to be 20 minutes of us and one, uh, uh, 50 minutes of you, 55 minutes of you. So um, so we'll just do, uh, and it is meant to be a workshop, so we'll do a bit of a, a whip around about who you are and uh, uh, and where you're from, because uh, hopefully we'll sort of be able to interact and talk through some of our leadership challenges as we go. Uh, I might uh, hand over to my partner, Kate, Dr. Jackson. <clears throat> Uh, hi everyone. Um, so I think I've met a few of you this morning. Um, so I'm Kate Jackson. I'm a director of Older People's Mental Health in New South Wales in the Ministry of Health um, in New South Wales. And so have had been in that role for quite a number of years and um, had a fair bit of experience in leading Older People's Mental Health policy. But in this case, also um, done quite a bit of work around leading physical health. Is that not not loud enough? No, no, I'm talking. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, I'm all good. Um, uh, leading uh, work around physical health practice improvement um, with our older people, um, older people's mental health services. So that's me, and I'm going to uh, give a few sort of examples from our work that might be helpful in terms of uh, leadership. Um, we might quickly go around the room, say who you are and where you're from. Uh, so we might start here. Welcome, Bonnie. Hi, everyone. My name is Veronica. I'm a care coordinator um, in the Brisbane, in Footprint, from this year's Mental Health Policy Review Committee. Um, and okay. Hi, I'm Heidi Stone. I'm based at Queensland University of Technology and I'm the Director of Aging Mental Health Practice Project. I might jump back behind now to Sally and then come around that table. And we're what country or st uh, a state or oh, town? Yeah, Queensland. Queensland? Yeah, uh, Queensland. Uh, oh, so and what part of Queensland? Uh, I'm in the White Bay. White Bay, yeah. Sunshine Coast, White Bay. Uh, yeah, North of Sydney. Right. So yeah. A lot of yeah. 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 Absolutely, Laura. Now, for those of you who don't speak mental health, I'm going to try and translate child, youth, mental health services. Mental health services, yep. Yep, KIMS. KIMS okay. And, uh, right, great. Right. And we're hearing from you a bit later, I think, Maggie. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, we might come around here. Uh, Chris Garrett, I'm Director of Mental Health Strategy at uh, the Commonwealth Department of Health. So these folk won't be able to say anything for the next six weeks. They can, <laughs> they can listen and the keepers are all confidential. Sorry, Carolyn. <laughs> Welcome. 
we might bring a couple of chairs around. Oh, there's two here, uh, Tim. Yep, and I might pull a couple of chairs around. Um, sorry, uh, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. <laughs> And who's on a panel later today as well. Um, okay, we're going to put you on the spot. We're just doing, did you get what we're doing? Yeah, just quick introductions. Yep, yep. <laughs> In what state? New South Wales. Thanks, Ian. Um, Tim from South East New South Wales PHN. I'm a peer worker. My job title is peer work coordinator. Peer work mental health peer coordinator. And I work also for the Mental Health Commission. <coughs> Welcome. I think we've got everyone. Have I missed out anyone? Did you want to introduce yourself, Mr. IV man? No, no. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> this will be, you're probably getting the most benefit out of this of anybody. Um, listen, uh, so yeah, I'm a professor of leadership and management at Charles Sturt Uni. We do a whole master's course on this, two years. And so we're going to try, so our challenge is to think, well, how can we distill this down to something that's helpful in about an hour? Um, prior to that time, I was an executive director of a mental health service, a mental health drug and alcohol service. Prior to that, a mental health and counselling service uh, in Western New South Wales of about a thousand staff and a budget of about 110 million per annum. So, had uh, I, you had some experience of try, having a go at leadership anyway, just just not the theory. So today, yeah, we're going to try and combine a, just a tiny bit of theory, but then sort of uh, work into some exercises that uh, I hope will realise value and realise. Um, your leadership capability and 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 how you combine your your personal uh, leadership characteristics and personal power, uh, and the, but then also think about how do you what leadership's really about and how do you marshal power and what power is. So, um, five minute uh, uh, time of going through some of the theory. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to do today. We've done the intros, a uh, bit of leadership theory and concepts. So I'm going to try and do that in five minutes. We're going to then do that exercise around personal power. And then we're going to uh, hand over to Kate, who's going to talk about implementation and her experiences of successful experiences over decades of implementation to make a change. Um, and then um, planning and strategy, that we've got a worksheet for that. We're not going to have time to do that, but we're going to introduce that and then you can take it away and, and use it as might hopefully be helpful. Um, so this is a, a snapshot of leadership theory uh, over the last 80 years or so. Um, it started about 1930s with a great man, you know, the leadership a person who sort of noticed the great man uh, there. So only men could be leaders. Women had to be sort of in the kitchen and, and could uh, take any role. But then it went on to the leadership trays, skills, then the behavioural skills and the contingency. Um, then we go implicit leadership theory, the member, leader member exchange, the notion of servant leadership. I remember sort of talking about that where everyone's a servant and still that's uh, reverberating around. Then with the charismatic transactional, Authentic's not in there. Oh, there is authentic. I didn't realise that took so long to come uh, onto the scene. Transformational, distributed, authentic, entrepreneurial. Um, so it's some of the th things of leadership as it's developed. When I look at that, I think there's a, a facet of truth in each of them. But really, their conceptions of, uh, and, and almost all of them, apart from distributed, um, they do have a focus on the individual. And I'm going to argue that that's not really what leadership is about. No, true power doesn't come out from an individual. It comes from uh, being able to harness a collective and thinking about what do I need to achieve m what I want. When I'm introducing this, so I, we're, we're going to work through some of this. So I, I want you to think of something that uh, a leadership project or activity or initiative that you have in mind, something you might want to do, uh, something you're just whimsically thinking you may do sometime, or something that you've already done. So. I want you to think of our scenario. So I'm not going to ask you to share it. Um, you're welcome. I will invite you if you want to share it. 
afterwards, but I'm not going to ask, force anyone to share it. So, but I'd, you will need it for your worksheets. Um, so, um, uh, when we go through. Um, some of the other more, um, isn't it funny whenever you do a presentation, the phone rings. Um, uh, some of the more recent stuff is, you know, the level five leadership, which is different about this. It's like this, unlike the charismatic great man theories, leadership is about compelling modesty, determination, um, a focus on company, or it can be the agenda, not yourself, um, responsibility for failure. Uh, who took responsibility for failure yesterday? Can we think of anybody? <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what's, what is the unemployment rate at the moment? Is it 5.4%? No, uh, sorry, guys, I'm going being political here. Um, but, yeah, uh, that was a good example of someone saying, yeah, sorry, I stuffed up, I got it wrong. Responsibility for failure, hopefully move on. If it wasn't a competitive election, it wouldn't be, it would be admirable, but now it's being used, you know, against him, of course. That's the, that's the role. Uh, and acknowledgement of others. Um, the key thing I want to talk about this, and uh, we can send out the references to this, but really any leader must understand that you, you, we're not the full constellation. We're all a constellation of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and, and any good leader has that modesty and a really good leader understands your weaknesses. A, and so a really frank assessment of what am I good at, but what am I not so good at it. And that's a, that's a first step in good leadership to say, the, the leader is not the person who does everything for everyone and is the, the biggest dog in the room. The leader is simply, as I talked about this morning, it's someone who gets people to follow them. It's, it's, it's an agentic relationship where influences others to follow. So anybody in a team who says, yeah, what about students? Why aren't we supporting students better in placements? And they go, oh, well, yeah, that's a good point. Let's put something in. Leader. Uh, someone who says, what about peers? Why are we not talking about the peer workforce and acknowledging them as part of a uh, mental health team? And, and the team goes, good point, leader. Um, so it's anyone who, who, who gets someone to follow them in any direction. It might be an agenda, it might be an action, it might be a series of values, but you influence others to follow your direction, you are a leader. It's not the person who's got the whole package, but it's a person who influences and that's and that's where power is. I'll talk about that now. <clears throat> so when we think about um, your lead, our, our leadership spectrum of leadership, it goes right through from the intrapersonal stuff, stuff you don't even know, like uh, Rosie Batty, etc. That power, her power, comes from her experience of, being, of of abuse, and look what she's done. You know, uh, Australian of the Year, and. Uh, but that's coming from deep within her. That's her power and motivation. Not everyone has that. But a lot of people, it's that interpersonal thing, the events that happen, um, and um, Benes says crucible experiences, experiences that shake you to your core, but then shape you and say, this defines me. This is what motivates me and this is what makes me powerful. That is enough. But then there's other aspects. It's the personal characteristics. A am I self-disciplined? Am I reliable? Am I honest? Um, what's my uh, diligence like? Um, th th those sorts of things. Uh, do I have a heart for developing and, and, and myself? So there's some of your personal skills. And then your interpersonal skills in terms of do you engage? Do you connect? Can you make eye contact? Can you link to people? Um, do you have empathy and a heart for people? Can you influence people? Can you convince people? Those interpersonal skills. And then we move out to the other ones in terms of positional power that you have as well. So yeah, you may be the director or the manager or, uh, you know, or, or a senior policy officer. You've got positional power. You've got another area of power. And then finally, it's the collective power of being able to, you know, this is what Equally Well is about, is about developing the power of the collective. One person can have an influence, but you get a collective power. And then we have the Me Too, um, the Black Lives Matter. All of that is, there's, there's a power in that huge power on that. So really I'm trying to say in terms of when we think of power, it goes from the spectrum of deep within inside you. In fact, stuff that we don't even realise motivates us. Why, why this is such a passion for us, we don't even know, through to these collective movements. So now, and in that, there's one other thing I want to mention about, which is really important, is the physics of power. I wrote about this about a, a year or so ago, but it's the physics of power. Um, you know, one person who spends all of their time and has got lots of energy, is powerful. 
one person who goes, oh, yeah, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And it's a flash in the pan and then forgets and moves on to something else. We've got to do this, we've got to do this. It's not so powerful. Two people are more powerful. Three or more. A thousand or more. A movement is incredibly powerful. So when we think about this, how can we utilise the mass of the power? The other issue is some things require all of that energy all at once. Flood response, bushfire response. You want to amass as much power as you can, uh, collectivise it, um, make sure that it's all harmonised and deploy it. This is very different from a consultation period uh, of you know, uh, lived experience guidelines or uh, you know, uh, values, you know, strategic planning in organisations. Say, we've got to do this properly, we've got to consult well. Which we, this takes time, a year, maybe two, if you want to do it well. So we need to think about those aspects of power. And that perseverance over time is also another physics of power. You know, ma uh, power is mass over velocity, the, the distance. That, so the number of people you've got and the, number of the amount of time that they're doing, distance over time, sorry, is power. Um, so that's a sort of broader, broad conceptual aspect of power. Now what I want to do is talk to, uh, go back to the personal power. Because we have to start there. We've got to start with us. Um, so we've got a worksheet. You should have a worksheet in front of you. If you don't, we'll get you some. Um, really what we want you to do for the next five minutes is to fill in worksheet document one and to think about your personal sources of power. There's no right or wrong answer. This is your assessment. I'm not going to ask you to share it unless you want to. We'll open it up to discussion afterwards, but I won't force anyone to share it. And rate yourself. And once again, a really powerful person is someone who understands what they're strong at and what they're weak at, because then you can put in mitigating strategies for your weaknesses. But if you don't know what your weaknesses are, you can't sort of address your mitigating strategies. So you don't have to have it all. In that uh, area, is a brief definition of each of those sources of personal power. So if you fill in, once again, I'm not going to ask you to share it. Uh, I might ask the volunteers to talk about their insights from it. Um, but if you could just fill that in for the next five minutes, and then we're actually going to bring that back in terms of any insights for about five or ten minutes. <coughs> those who are online streaming, uh, I apologise we don't have the emails out to you. We, weren't to, we don't even know who was coming in on this one. Um, but hopefully you can see this, your screen. Yep. And if you can, you can jot down uh, on a, a pad. We'll leave that screen up while we're doing this exercise. Any questions about this or is this clear at this stage? Okay, I'll give you five minutes. Okay, we'll, um, we might just uh, bring that back to the group uh, now. And once again, there's no compunction to share, but uh, I'm going to invite some people who, who volunteers to share. So um, for expert, uh, what were some of the things that came out of that uh, for s somebody? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that in a sec. I'll just come around the room a little bit. Yes, Laura. Awesome. Uh, did I see a hand up over here? No? Someone else? Yes, Jeff. Um, in terms of expert, it's actually it's a combination of your life's experiences. It's, we're all working in, in some way, I think, in the mental health field. Um, a lot of us have got lived experience and we've then added to it whatever professional development tertiary courses that are, were appropriate. So in my case, I've done uh, 
No, thanks. And, and that was sort of my sense of it. It's, like, it's not one's better than the other, but, you know, mental health, we talk about experts by experience. If you've got experience with mental illness, you've got expertise. And you go, what's that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but if you're designing a new service, you go, well, I don't have any architectural expertise. I don't have an in any engineering expertise. That's a zero. So how do I get or oh and expertise, so how do I get hold of that? Um, so uh, I guess really the point of this is saying you don't have to have all the expertise, um, but recognise what you've got and then think about what the other, uh, where you can get it. Like what is your project? And if I don't have that expertise, where am I going to get it from? And because you don't always have to be, you know, as, as it says here, the biggest dog in the room, you're the leader. You're the, you, you're the conductor of the orchestra. So maybe your expertise is leading and bringing people together collaboratively and then all the other experts in terms of experts by experience, the clinical experts, the design experts, the engineering experts, you, your expertise is bringing them together. So trying to highlight that. How do you go with referent? And so that's, that's uh, more about um, how you come and, and your standing. I, there's a number of people here that I would say have that already. There's a... Uh, <coughs> Me, that's yeah. what I think about it. It's like I could, I'm assistant commissioner, but I could just as well be the cleaner. Yeah, yeah. It makes no difference. But I'd argue that you have a lot of referent power because of your accomplishments and what you've done in the field for decades. So I'd say your referent power is, and it, and it can, and it comes with your humility as well, which is even stronger. I think if someone's got massive accomplishments and a reputation and experience, People go, Maggie, this refer high reference power, but humble. And, and I think that's, just, that's great, yeah. So I think that's a great example of referent. You're a great example of referent power, in my opinion. Because uh, when, when you turn up, you go, Maggie's got all this experience and accomplishments and a track record. And that's powerful. And even if you're humble, that comes with you. You don't have to, you don't have to big note because you've got that reference. So there's a lot of power in your accomplishments and your track record. And I would argue sometimes, and respect, and some of that is your integrity. Say what you do, do what you say. And if, um, and if you can't do it, say, sorry, I can't do it. That's referent. You come with, with uh, respect and a, and a reputation for acting with integrity and not doing, you know, saying more than you can do or when there's challenges being honest about that, uh, which I think is probably, quite frankly, in my opinion, it's one of the most important sources of power, is that people can trust you and they see you as a person of integrity. How about reward? This is a trickier one, and I think, Caroline, you were asking about that.
And I must say, being in meetings with you, you're tremendously powerful in this respect. You don't realise it. But look at you now, smiling, nodding, paying attention, affirming. Caroline never knew that that's the impact that you have on me and others. It's like, well, you know, when you're floundering, things are not going too well. Look at you now. You can't help yourself nodding and affirming. <laughs> that's reward and social encouragement. That's inc- and that's incredibly powerful. That very says, yeah, I- I'm with you here. Just that little nod, the smile and encouragement. And it doesn't have to be a lot. It's incredibly powerful. People, you know, it's the transactional analysis. People always talk about, you know, was it warm fuzzies and cold pricklies? We all crave approval and attention. If someone gives it to us, it's, it's a very fundamental, it meets a very fundamental need for us when they go, great job, great job, Caroline, in your presentation and all the work you've done with older persons there. And, but even that nodding, etc. Any other examples of that? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a good point. Yeah. To really being present and a deep listening. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a great point through social, we can do that through social media as well. I'm going to jump down, I'm going to, uh, because of the time, uh, we've got just a few more minutes. So jump down to maybe uh, networks and then connection. Um, So in terms of the network ones, anyone to share something from that? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, for helping others to form those networks as well because those networks, once again, we talked about the physics of power. Like one organisation, two organisations is more powerful than one and as in one of Kate's projects, you put five or six together and John's project is more powerful again. Yeah, I think linking and building relationships. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that's what we all have. We all have networks, so we've all got the power to link and build those relationships and to nurture those relationships and consolidate uh, those relationships. Um, All right, we're just going to finish off with uh, maybe just talk through charismatic uh, and connection. And I think, um, uh, I think, Caroline, you talked a little bit about that. And uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your name. Yeah, yeah. Maria. Maria. Yeah, you talked about that too in terms of deep listening, which is really about that connection. Uh, being able to identify and and connect at a deep level. But any others want to share around uh, charismatic or connection? I think charismatic is being authentic. Yeah. Um, And being able to bring people along. Now, uh, a lot of the leadership theorists say this is not necessarily a good thing because charismatic leaders can lead people down the wrong path. <laughs> so it's not as good. It used to be great, but now it's not so ga- uh, good. You know, people like, you know, Putin and Hitler are charismatic leaders, but it's not ne- or necessary because all that means is um, you've got the gift of the gab and you convince people to follow you. So it can be good, but it can be bad because you can convince people to follow you down the wrong path. Um, and, and at one stage, that charismatic leader was all that, you know, the person there, come on, guys, a new strategic plan, and here's our new KPIs, we can do it, da, 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 da. Well, maybe the KPIs are the wrong KPIs that you're striving for rather than, you know, we were talking about this uh, the other day in terms of having uh, integrity, the foundations of the research being based, you know, on the right values, you know, on consumer co-design and consumer-led, et cetera. So... Yep. Yeah, good point. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to finish up now, but any other observations around that, around those particular ones or overall? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, uh, I mean, this is a, a simple analysis of power. There's a whole other analysis of like your, your values and the ethics behind that of how that's how you use that power and you know for what purpose that it's genuine and it's not manipulative. Yeah, thanks. Any other? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, yes, and, and utilise it. So that, that was where I was going to finish, so thanks. Um, because in a sense, really what this is saying, you don't need to have all of these. Just understand which ones you've got and in the, within that particular task and which ones you don't, and then think, how do I get it? How do I get the charismatic... Um, should I say bullshit artist? How, how do I get the person who can, you know, gets up there and convinces everyone to go? How do I get the person who's got the heart for others? If I, you know, how do I get the person who's got the the, the nose for a problem? How do I get the person who's got their eye on the budget? How do I get the person who's got the ear of the minister to get some money or something like that? How do I get the person who's got the networks that we need for this project? So, really, what this is saying is, if I don't, ha I don't have to have it. A leader says, I don't have that, but where can I get it from? And who, collective, who do we bring in as part of that collective leadership team to do that? So the first step, say, what can I do? Uh, and what, what can be enhanced? The next step, say, yeah, where can we get it from? And once again, it depends on the, what the job is and the particular aspect of that. But that's, thank you for bringing that, really, that sum of this exercise. I'm going to hand over to Kate, who's going to talk more about, this is more about personal stuff. Kate's going to talk no more about the... the implementation through a system of actual projects. Thanks. <laughs> Normally John helps me out with <laughs> when I have a technical problem. Um, yeah, so look, um, just to lead into our next uh, set of workshop exercises, I'm just going to talk you through a couple of examples of um, work that we've done in Older People's Mental Health in New South Wales. Um, uh, the first one is our, which some of you have heard about this morning, but um, hopefully won't mind hearing about a bit again, um, is our work around uh, physical health practice improvement um, with older consumers of mental health services. Um, and uh, John's here and co-presented with, with me this morning has been very, very involved in this work as well. Um, the other is our work over a number of years in uh, developing older people's mental health services in rural areas of New South Wales. Um, and I think they both give a, a few key lessons um, for, for this work. Why didn't that work for me before? Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, so each of, with each of these sort of examples, I'm going to talk about, well, what, what did we have? So when we, we, at the outset, what were we, when we analysed some of the things that we had in place um, and what some of those strengths might be and some of those challenges might be, um, and then what did we do? And then how did that all pan out in terms of what we might le learn from that around leadership? Um, so in our physical health practice improvement project, a statewide project um, in New South Wales, what we had was we had strong evidence, and you're all aware of this because you're here at this conference, but um, about the need to act. Um, we, we knew a lot about the problem, but we also knew that there's an implementation gap in terms of what works and um, putting what works into action. Um, we had the fact that um, physical health of people with mental illness is a policy priority, both nationally and at a statewide level. Um, and uh, in, in New South Wales, um, as in all other states and territories and nationally, we've signed up to equally well. So we had that policy um, commitment. You don't always have that um, in, in my area of work, but thankfully in this case we did. We also had, uh, we had statewide benchmarking processes in, in older people's mental health in New South Wales, have done that for a number of years, and that's a way of reflecting on practice um, in our services, but also understanding where are the areas for quality improvement. And this is something that had come through many times um, in, in benchmarking as an issue, that our practice in terms of physical health assessment and care in older people's mental health services was um, not where we would hope it to be. So we had an acknowledged issue. Um, 
we had strong support from our local leaders of older people's mental health services. So um, within local health districts um, across the state, all um, agreeing that yes, this is something where we want to focus some attention. We see it as a problem. We want to make some improvements. Um, we also had done a statewide practice improvement project, again, coming out of our benchmarking work um, around improving recovery oriented practice um, in New South Wales in older people's mental health services. And so that gave us a bit of an approach that we could build on. So we had all of those sort of foundational things in place. That worked, I've got the hang of it. Um, so, so what did we do? Well, we, as I say, we built on a previous approach um, uh, which involved a collaboration between the central office, so the ministry where I work, and our local health districts. Um, we, uh, we, we took an approach of using, because we didn't have resources, so sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but you can still achieve something within existing resources, or sometimes getting, bringing momentum to it brings, brings resources as well. So we uh, did this within existing resources using an opt-in and start where you can approach. And that's important, I think, because the start where you can gives everyone an opportunity to be involved. Um, and the opt-in means that um, we're not saying that you have to be part of this, but actually um, because of the enthusiasm that was built and the networks that we have and the support and commitment um, that we had, everyone did buy in. Um, so they, they, all of our local health districts did um, opt in. Um, we needed and we had statewide um, leadership from a project team, but also a, an, a statewide uh, steering group. Um, and that was really important in terms of guiding and supporting also the, the local um, projects um, that have been taken forward. We also harness that local level leadership. So um, we identified project champions and supporting managers to, to lead at that, um, the, the projects at the local level. And we also um, partnered with a number of community managed organisations, so in, involved um, uh, them in the project. Um, so we had collaboration at a whole lot of different levels. We also encouraged and certainly um, in many instances were able to, to have consumer consultation and uh, collaboration um, and, co and ideally co-design and some of the local projects did have a co-design element to them. And we encouraged evaluation um, through a research collaboration. Um, so that's the way it rolled out. So these were these, these are John's reflections um, because he was our statewide project manager. Um, and so, how did it work? So, what um, uh, communicating progress and celebrating success that was important. Um, and I think we've heard that this morning as well that that can uh, generate uh, momentum and engagement. Um, having the project start where you can um, has allowed it to adapt. So as as, as people's starting place, you know, changed and was impacted by COVID, they were able to restart um, uh, where, where they left off. Um, uh, team building approach um, across sectors. So that requires a lot of commitment. Um, there's a lot of time involved in this and mostly that's been John's time, I have to say, in this project, um, has done, done a lot of the, the, the ongoing legwork around the project. Um, uh, but but it, that can really pay off. And also, don't be put off by complexity. Um, complexity can be challenging, um, but with the sort of, and we're all working in a complex system, um, but with the persistence and the time and the support and the continued commitment, you still can make inroads. Um, and these, these were some of my um, uh, reflections um, as the policy lead for the project. So uh, I think creating the right environment for collaboration um, has been really important because um, collaboration, out of collaboration comes a whole lot more capacity and that's what we've just been talking about there, having, using your networks, building your networks. Um, leadership and collaboration are mutually supportive. You can't have one without the other, you can't lead on your own because if, if you're leading on your own, no one's following um, and you're not really uh, achieving much. Policy commitment helps. As I've said, um, we've had policy commitment in this case, but you don't always have that and sometimes you can build policy commitment through the, the work that you do. 
Um, persistence and adaptability are both essential. I'm a long distance runner and it helps. It helps with this sort of stuff, but sticking in there um, when, you know, when it, it's tough um, and, and remaining positive and, and committed to it. Um, but also adapting as you need to, and certainly we've had lots of cause to adapt um, in this project with all the changes of context. Um, building strong collaborative initiatives can help uh, to scale up to other sites. So um, we have one example of a, a project that initially evolved, involved collaboration between NEMI and uh, a couple of our local health districts. Um, and. Um, uh, with the changes of personnel, et cetera, and the impacts on services. Some of our local health districts weren't able to continue on with their previous projects, but they have been able to join as um, additional pilot sites with the NEMI project. So that has allowed us to continue to uh, keep people on board and uh, um, involved and involved in achieving something in this space. Um, and research partnerships so have added complexity, that's for sure, um, but also hopefully um, that, that will um, build um, further action through the um, sharing the outcomes of these projects. Um, so that, that, that's one example. Um, and I'm just going to take you on to another one briefly. And how am I going for time? A bit over? Okay. Uh, I'll be very quick with this one then. Because it can be. So I'm, I'm going to dash through the context. Um, this was, is really uh, the, the, the work that we've done in improving access to older people's mental health services in rural areas. Um, I'll dash through it. It is like a 15 to 20 year kind of <laughs> labour of love. Um, but um, very challenging. Many of you will be aware of some of the challenges of um, rural health service delivery in older people's mental health. Um, we started with virtually no older people's mental health services in rural um, areas of New South Wales. Um, so a whole lot of challenges there. But we did have some things to build on. We did have mental health services in rural areas. We did have um, a policy commitment um, in this instance as well to um, building older people's mental health services. What we did was to, to, to build that, that policy and plan, planning kind of basis for, for this work. And one of the key uh, principles of that was around equity of access. So identifying some of those uh, principles has been important. What we also did was to build the collaborative um, mechanisms for bringing older people's mental health leaders from across the state, from local health districts, together with our policy um, team and building that collaboration. And that has stood us in good stead for the last 20 years and it has enabled some of the work that I've just talked about. Um, and, and part of that was about building that leadership, building the leadership purposefully um, at a local level. Uh, we did get some funding associated with this. First we got the plan and then we got the funding. So just shows some of the, sometimes these things uh, pay off. And again, consistency of, of effort, I think, and communication. And so how did that work? Well, actually we did um, uh, over, over the last 15 years or so, 10 to 15 years, 23 new community older people's mental health teams across seven local health rural local health districts of New South Wales where we virtually had nothing previously. So that's been a huge outcome, a number of other inpatient service developments. But importantly, we had a sustained increase in um, access to older people's mental health community services in rural areas. So 440% um, increase in access um, to those uh, older people's mental health services between 2004-05 and 2009-10. So that, that work's been published um, and the, the reference uh, is, is there in the slide. But um, so it, it was effective um, and it has been sustained as well. So. Um, so it just goes to show, if you put some of these things together, sometimes it can pay off. And so finally, and this is leading into the, um, uh, the workshop exercises that we have for you, um, when we're thinking about the authorising environment for, for the work that we're doing or hoping to do um, in some cases, um, we need to think about those, what are those guiding documents, those endorsed they might be a policy, but they might also be um, a plan. They might be a procedure. They might be some uh, the consensus statement for equally well. They, they might be small or they might be big, but some of those um, guiding documents. Also looking at that 
uh, in this case the sort of central office leadership, um, but you might be working in various different contexts, so it might be at the, the, the leadership of your organisation or your service. Um, so having that will help. Um, having then local and local um, leadership in this case has been very important as well. So thinking about that authorising environment, what do you need to, to bring um, uh, to, to take something forward? And then when we think about um, ca capacity and capability, another thing that we're going to be um, talking through and giving you an exercise around. Um, so in, in, in this instance, what we have found is sustained consultation um, and capacity building has been important. Um, and you have sometimes two steps forward and one step back, but if you keep, keep at it, you um, keep building that capacity. The partnerships, the collaboration, um, having some consistency and guiding sort of principles, um, but also having some flexibility in terms of adapting um, and having some local um, uh, adaptation. Funding helps, but it's not essential, as I've said. Sometimes you, d you don't start with it, but you're able to draw in resources as you build success. And evaluation also helps in that longer term um, sustainability of some of the action that you take. So sorry, I've taken a little bit longer, but we're gonna move into the workshop. Um, uh, just a lit review we did uh, about 10 years ago, like what's the evidence base, uh, the strong evidence base for achievement in primary mental health care? And we came up with these major things, these, or, or these factors, which in a sense will be the, the preface for uh, us. Um, the organisational factors, the clinic and clinician factors, the partnership factors and the infrastructure factors. So underneath there's a, there, there's a whole heap, there's a couple of publications I think in BMC Health Services that we did. Um, and essentially what we said is the more of these you've got in place, the more likely it's going to work, basically. But the other take home message is some work with just one. So you don't need it all. Really what this, and if, if you have a look at worksheet 2A, the authorising environment, and then 2B, the capability and capacity analysis, um, and start to fill that out because basically the evidence says the more of these you can get, the more likely you're going to succeed. It's not to say you can't succeed with one and power and passion alone. And uh, I know some of those, uh, uh, some major innovations have just happened like that. But really the evidence says the more of these you've got, the more likelihood that you'll, you'll be successful. So just start, we're going to give you five, maybe five minutes to fill out uh, 2A uh, and just see with your, once again, with your project that you've got in mind, what's the status of it at the moment? So once again, a bit of an analysis of where you're up to. If, you, um, if you're not already, if you get onto the um, uh, handout 2B, which is the capacity and capability, I've got to say in almost all leadership programs and all change programs, this is underdone. People always, always underestimate how long it takes, how much work it takes and how much capacity it makes. So this is to, uh, to actually think about, well, you, what is your capability and what's your capacity to make the changes that you want? I'd have to say 99.9% .9 of the time it is underdone. Very rarely I've seen a change project that understands this because it's always twice as complex, twice as hard and twice as long. So, um, but five minutes on that and then we, we'll get you to share it in small groups and then we'll bring back the summary into the large group. So five minutes on the 2B. All right, um, just because of time, I'm going to get people just to share a few things on, firstly on the um, worksheet 2A. Um, and and on the, um, probably on that one, two, third column, so just share with ideas of, of any of those aspects of the authorising environment, any ideas about, you know, how you might integrate, you know, stuff that you haven't accessed yet, how you might access it and integrate it, any ideas about, so if you could talk about, you know, what, what the aspect is in the first column and then think about uh, any ideas you had in terms of accessing what you didn't actually have yet. Yeah. 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 Where I had total support for resources, I had total support of the organisation and the commissioner, and um, I could write policy for it, and there was no question about that. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. Just, just support along yeah. the way. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I had a project like that once. Uh, <laughs> in actual fact, it, it, but, um, in fact, we had spare money, so I went to the minister and said, if you want this done properly, this is my point I made before about capacity, I need $800,000 for a team to do this for a year. Do that, I deliver it on time, on budget, safe, no incidents, because there's a recruitment delay. They said yes, We've got a team of eight people for a year to do it properly. Commissioned 73 new mental health beds and services across you know regional New South Wales, fully staffed on time, on budget. And that politicians love that because my friends, Tim, uh, from North Sydney, go, you know, we never do that in the country. And like, so when the, while their unit was still closed and then the political thing, ours were all, up and going, not, yeah. And because we had all of those things, yeah. I think, I think what it does, when you do it once, they, the powers that be have the faith that you can do it again. And that just gives you more enticement to go yeah. on. Yeah. And that's the point you made before about reference power. Like your your history, your uh, expertise, and your track record is incredibly powerful. If someone's thinking, oh, "Who are we going to give this money to?" Give it to these people because last time we did it, they did it well. Any other observations, Sally? You've got an awesome project, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a great point in terms of uh, the, uh, communicating what you've done. And uh, if you don't tell the message, often no one else will. So, but to communicate in a way that with the uh, validity. Uh, but, but you guys are just absolutely amazing what you're doing. Hopefully we see it published soon. Saving lives, so many lives. We think 200 lives that you've probably saved in the last through the, your project, the clinical collaborative smoking one. That is just astounding. Yeah, and they're documenting that. So we'll be able to... Uh, you know, uh, you'll be able to, um, you know, evidence that. And it, oh, yes, there's a plug. Um, uh, uh, yes, Laura. Yep. Absolutely. There's two things I want to say. The narrative story is a really strong story, but politicians and stuff look at return on investment, cost-benefit analysis and, and the data. And that goes back to our first worksheet. It's like expertise. Yeah, but I refuse to work for an NGO because I, I critique governments who fund the NGOs. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's other forms of expertise. You can get critical expertise as well. So think about, you know, where do I get another voice which will add to the power of my voice? That's, that's a great insight, really. Um, I'm conscious of the time. We're going to have to move on to 2B, capability and capacity analysis. As I said this morning, some organisations have got, haven't got the capability. They're always in the midst of a restructure. They've got all the key people uh, sort of uh, acting or being recruited to. And it's like, and you ask them to do this. Well, they can't even manage their day-to-day -day processes. So what hope are you going to do a major change process? So we need to think about capacity and capability. So any reflections on that uh, from filling that one out, particularly in terms of next steps, any creative ways of getting accessing capacity and capability? Karen? Yeah, yeah. But in-kind capability and capacity is, is one of the easiest ways to amplify your power. Um, and it's amazing how many people, that's the thing with the Equal shared agenda. Uh, and so all of the people on the Equal Alliance, they're all pro bono. They're giving a huge amount of time. And in the end, we might give the chair a bottle of wine, you know, which we'll pay for, you know, so, uh, you know, a, a $30 bottle of wine for hundreds of thousands of dollars of commitment, pro bono commitment. It's like, yeah. So it's thinking about where do we get that capability from? Yes.
will make this a priority early on in, in projects. People have a lot of capacity, but if they don't make that a priority. And then I got to thinking that, um, so I do a, some lived experience research and work with lived experience researchers, and the good health of researchers is really important, ensuring that we have capacity to yeah. be able to do research. <clears throat> and then I think in terms of, as a peer support worker, what makes for good health, and it's often the relationships in, within the team and being able to check on, in on each other when we're doing a bit rough, and that makes the team so much more uh, uh, wanting to get the job done when we all do have the capacity. Yeah. That's a great point. I know for me, for that same project I was talking about before, my light bulb moment was at 7.30 at night, eight of my senior executives were working on this project. They, we've got other jobs. We can't commission all these services because we've got full-time other jobs. And that's when I said, we can't, we're not going to do this. Something's going to go wrong. That's why I had to go to the minister and said, listen, here's the plan. No, no, no addition to the budget, just realign the opening dates and et cetera. And yet, so to look after... When you think about getting additional capacity, be, we've got to be careful that we don't burn out the people we've already got. Because if, if someone takes on something else, it means every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. What are you saying no to? The other part of your job, your family, your recreation, uh, your mental health, your physical health, because that was what was happening for us. We, you know, people were just working longer hours. So thinking through that, how we do, is really vital in terms of that capacity. Any other? Okay, we're going to finish on time, which is good. It's always a good thing. Um, so, um, bringing this in terms of adaptive, like Heifetz has got this theory of adaptive leadership, where it's like there's a lot of wicked problems. They don't have an easy solution. It's actually a process through this. Uh, and in fact, in a way, the leader is often the conductor of the orchestra. It's not even a very good analogy. I'm not, so I don't know why I put that graphic in, but anyway. But you lead by commanding and directing attention. You pull, but you know, that's what Equally Well is about. All the deaths per day, all these avoidable deaths, these preventable deaths, how we can... So, so keeping this on people's agenda. Um, and when something good happens, keeping it on agenda. Um, deciding the holding environment, which means where are you going to deal with it? Like yesterday, we were workforce round, uh, research roundtable. So they brought people together and Rosemary Calder sort of brought that through, which is the holding environment. How are we going to work through research priorities in this area? Um, and you need to think about your holding environment too. Is it a consumer forum or isn't it an executive briefing? So what's your environment where you're going to you know, work this through? Um, providing access to information, like giving the information, providing the information that people need to make decisions, framing the issues. This is so vital in terms of leading is framing issues, whether it's a problem or an opportunity, you know, uh, advocacy or despair, you know, uh, uh, and, and framing it as in terms of what's being asked is unreasonable. We don't have capacity for that and we're not going to do it. So the good leader frames the issue and says, I'll protect you guys. I'm going back and say, this is completely unreasonable. We don't have the capacity. If we're going to do this, we're going to get approval not to do something else. Or framing the opportunity, like, it's terrible, it's crap, etc. but this is a great opportunity. Let's advocate. Let's get people together. Leaders frame that agenda. They frame positively or negatively. Um, and sometimes you need to orchestrate conflict. I remember one of the early things, <laughs> Tim, with consumers and some psychiatrists, and there's a bit of conflict there. As it should. Some of the psychiatrists, their the, um, entrenched stigma and views need to be challenged and to sort of orchestrate that, but in a respectful fashion. Because in the end, most of us are on the same team. But you've got to have the conflict to get the, you know, to get the heat, to get the generation and get, and get the change. But you've got to orchestrate that. It, it, it's got to, I think it's got to be respectful for everyone involved. But conflict is not bad. Conflict means caring. If there's no conflict, nobody cares. So when, when there's conflict, it means we, we care about this enough to get angry and agitated. Um, choose the decision-making process. So think through how are we going to do this? And once again, this is really important in, in mental health in terms of equality. And that's what we did when we started the consensus statement. I knew we had some very um, confident psychiatrists uh, and cons uh, confident uh, state directors, but I also knew we had some quite traditionally disempowered consumers and carers. But their views, in my view, are equal. So we took all the arguments out and we gave people clickers. 
and they voted one to seven. We put propositions up and they voted and every vote was equal because every view was equal. So thinking about the decision-making process and you saw the graph, the decision-making process is we only put things into the consensus statement that every sector agreed to with. And you know, if someone was an outlier, they because you could, you could show up the results straight away, they go, oh, way. They go, oh, I'm the only one who thinks that, so I'll keep quiet. Oh, and it stops people grandstanding and violently agreeing on stuff. So think about the decision-making process in a way that uh, gives some equality to the process as well. So why am I introducing this? Got a minute. Um, so when we think about this, uh, your change leadership program may have a number of components and at every single stage we need to go through this to do it well. In terms of the contemplation stage, decision making, right through to evaluation and review. So when we go through this process of um, applying your personal power and then bringing in the, the, these other aspects of power and capability and authorising environment, we need to think through that because it just doesn't happen. You don't have the thought and it happens. There's these processes that we need to go through one after the other and Kate's project and John's project is a great example of that. And really, really good projects often take a while because to do it properly, you've got to go through this properly. Because if you don't do it properly at the at start, you lose the integrity of the project. You, you, you undermine the integrity of the project. You say, hang on, that decision-making process wasn't legitimate. And, but you're ran down to consolidation and then someone's still trying to white ante. Fair enough, because it wasn't legitimate. So we need to think through all of that. So in a way, we put this all together, you know, in terms of the cooking method as well, you know. So is it a slow cook? Is it like a strategic plan? Do you let it bubble along slowly? Or do you orchestrate the conflict, have the flambe flames and stuff like that and get it over and done with the go? And so we need to think about what's your cooking method? You know, uh, who are the participants? How much heat are you going to put on it? Are you going to wind down the heat? Are you going to wind up, wind up the heat? You know, the, the J curve, the Yerkes Dobson law, is you've got, there's this zone of maximum performance. Not enough heat, everyone's bored and asleep. Too much heat, everyone's arguing and anxious. You need to get in that zone of optimum performance. Um, and the duration and the pressure, all of those things, it's like you're cooking up a, a, a new uh, something wonderful. Not in my case, it's always pretty ordinary what I cook up uh, for dinner. But um, So I'm going to get you to, your third handout is this one. And this is one that I mentioned that we're going to take away. Um, so at your leisure, as it's helpful, we'll send out some uh, more references and some uh, to you as well. Uh, this is from Heifetz, uh, Adaptive Leadership, uh, this sort of model, and it's really helpful for some of the wicked problems that we have in mental health service uh, reform and development. So um, that's it. It's time. It's two minutes over. My apologies. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>